So this is a great chance for you to both understand uh, about technical footwear, but I think also Dave's going to share with just a glimpse of what is it like to have a brand try to explain to those in the industry like buyers and others. So uh, join me in welcoming Dave Dole. Thanks, Sean. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come out. I think this is a really exciting program, and when I first heard about it, my brain started moving faster than I could keep up with. You're going to come out of here after four years um, and into your first job with a level of knowledge that it took me five or ten years to develop. So um, congratulations in advance. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Oboe story, who we are, what our values are. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the trajectory that I've been on um, in, in the industry. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, kind of what to expect when you uh, break in and start out in the outdoor industry. Um, and whoa, you're wearing a suit and tie, man. That's awesome. Thanks for, thanks for dressing up. Appreciate it. Um, and then we'll leave some time for questions. And then um, if you don't have to move on to your next thing, um, I'll stick around for a while after in the foyer and we can you know, unpack whatever you want to unpack. So feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, just reach up and grab that uh, cord, pull for a stop. Um, you know, I, I don't have much of an agenda except to get you some information that'll be helpful. So if you need to start steering us in that direction, you can do that. Um, okay, so oboes, footwear. Um, how many of you have a pair of oboes? Okay, pretty good. So for under 30, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Um, we're admittedly kind of an over 35 brand. Um, we're, we've been around for about 11 years. And um, so Oboes stands for Outside Bozeman. And the name came from uh, a customer put in, or wanted to put in the first purchase order for, for shoes. And they're like, you have to have a brand before we can put in an order. So um, the founders were sitting in a hotel room at 3 o'clock in the morning in China and came up with Oboes for Outside Bozeman after they'd gone through a list of about 300 names. So uh, Bozeman is a big deal to us. We don't manufacture in Bozeman. I always like to you know, set that up. Um, we do manufacture in Vietnam and I lived at the factory and worked at the factory for a while. So if you want to talk Asia manufacturing, supply chain, sourcing, any of that, we can definitely dig into that um, later on. Um, but uh, we do manufacture in Vietnam, but we do design development, sales, marketing, uh, operations. Everything happens out of Bozeman. And Bozeman informs who we are as a company and what we do as a company. So um, if you look at... The Yellowstone ecosystem and the the uh, the public lands immediately surrounding Bozeman, like within a hundred mile radius, you're looking at 18 million acres of public lands. So that informs what we're doing with our design process and what kind of products we're making and what kind of solutions we're coming up for for people. All right, so the garage story. Everybody talks about the garage story. We were talking about this last night. Um, uh, at the at the dinner table at Sean's house, and um, so John, these are the, our four founders up here, and the personalities I think are are important and and uh, and ties into the history. So John uh, had a store in the '70s called the Store in Richmond, Virginia, and it's three levels. The first level. Well, the third level is waterbeds, and I don't know why they put waterbeds on the third level. But the next level down was, shall we say, a smoking accessories shop. And then the, the ground level um, was hippie clothing, like fringe leather jackets and beaded stuff. And so John um, was really into the outdoors, and he started um, kind of discovering these products, and he discovered this 
really great hiking boot from Germany. And he started importing a few size runs here and there. And his customers were like, these things are great. What else can you get from, from Europe? So he'd import backpacks and sleeping bags. And this is before the North Face and before Sierra Designs. This is like way back when you guys weren't even born. And so that kind of morphed into an outdoor store. And so John did that for a while, sold it to a partner, became a sales rep for Technica, um, an Italian ski boot brand. He had a company that made and sold shoelaces for a while. And then he um, was one of the uh, early on folks at Montreal way back when, sales manager at, um, at uh, I'm blanking out, 510. And then was the president of Vask for a while. So 30 years, he had all these existing relationships with retail buyers and with um, different stores around. So he was 60 years old and um, he went and had an appointment with the buyer for outdoor footwear at REI and um, Denise and different buyer now. Okay, so Denise says, hey John, you ever thought about making your own thing, making your money for yourself instead of somebody else? or all these ideas that you want to do that are hard to do, difficult to do, um, starting from scratch. And um, he's like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. It's kind of pie in the sky. And she's like, not so much, because if you made it, I'd buy it. So here's the person who controls the purse strings for you know, most of the outdoor industry's footwear um, and buys more outdoor footwear than any other person or entity in the whole world says, if you made a company and you made shoes, we'd, we'd buy them from you. And it's like, okay, well, that's pretty enticing. And about a week later, somebody from uh, a large retailer in Southern Hemisphere said the same thing to him, and he's like, huh. So then he goes to his friend's birthday party, his best friends from uh, junior high. They're, they're all still in touch. And um, these guys uh, sold shampoo companies built up shampoo companies and sold them off and made a ton of money. So they invested originally $435,000, which is not much. I did a costing study once for a bag company that wanted to start making women's casual shoes. We came up with $8 million as a, as a jumping off point. And so $435 initial investment, by the time it was all said and done, they put in a million and a half um, investment and John cashed in every favor that he ever had with anybody and um, leveraged some factory relationships and partnered with some really smart people that he'd worked with before and trusted, and they kicked off this brand. Three years in, they turned their first profit. So that's John's story and kind of the origin of, of how it came about. Sean and I were also talking about a lot of these things come out of dissatisfaction. You know, you can look at a lot of the brands that we wear and think, ah, somebody got pissed off there and went and started their own brand and now that brand's huge, and then now that brand's established, and they're the man, and the next thing is, is evolving from that. So with John, I think it wasn't so much like, oh, these brands that I work for are, are oppressive or, or whatever. I think it was more like limiting factors. He had a lot of ideas to build into the shoes um, that were... Uh, Really great ideas, but were hard to do in, ex in an existing um, supply chain and an existing cost structure. Okay, so we partnered with these other guys. Josh, well, so you've heard of 510, you know, climbing shoes, right? Stealth rubber. So Josh is one of maybe four or five people on the planet that knows the formula for stealth rubber. It's like Coca-Cola. Anyone know the Coca-Cola myth? Or not myth, but mythology? about the recipe for Coca-Cola. So you can't patent a recipe. So you have to just keep it secret. So it's inside of safe, inside of another safe in Atlanta. And only like the family members of, that started Coca-Cola have the combination. That's the myth anyway. Same thing with rubber. It's a formula. It's also a process, but you can't patent the formula. So you have to keep it a secret. So there's only a few people that know it. Not to say that our rubber is like stealth. It, 
it's for a different purpose. But here's a guy who knew a lot about rubber formulation, rubber process, and supply chain management. Chuck was a designer, um, a contract designer. He actually started out at Nike. He came out of furniture school in, um, at uh, Appalachian State and got picked up by Nike to make fixtures for stores and then eventually got over into footwear and then started as uh, doing his own thing contract. And you're probably wearing or have at home in your closet something that Chuck has designed. And then Tim was at Sims Fishing in Bozeman and he took Sims from $5 million to $50 million, which is a huge growth phase and a lot of issues and a lot of problems that come out with that. So the four of these guys, they got together and they started Oboes with a partnership from some of John's friends, a little bit of seed money, and um, 11 years later, we're approaching a number that I can't say, but it's pretty significant. We've had about 30 to 40 percent growth a year over the last five years. Clicker. So, outside Bozeman, we talked about that. Big deal for us is we were acquired um, the same week the Altar was acquired. That's why no one ever heard about us getting acquired because somebody bigger than us bought somebody bigger than us. Um, so Kathmandu is this interesting, uh, anybody familiar with them f from New Zealand. New Zealand? All right, so you've been to New Zealand or Australia. Think of the, uh, familiar with MEC in Canada? MEC is a large retailer that's a cooperative. So you're seeing this trend between REI, Cooperative United States, MEC, Cooperative Canada, Kathmandu Cooperative Outdoor uh, Gear Store in Australia and New Zealand. They've got about 150 stores. Um, and they were one of the original customers of Oboes. And John had a long standing relationship with them. They're really focused on travel um, and very focused on sustainability. And I haven't put a lot of details on the slide about that, but um, they're the first and only um, entity in the Southern Hemisphere to have a fair trade certification. Um, very innovative on um, reducing environmental footprint on all the products that you all are learning how to create and make. So um, they acquired us in April of this year. It was a pretty cool acquisition. I've, I've gone through a few, I named a couple of those companies that I work for, and some of them I don't work for them anymore because I moved on from there and just naturally went somewhere else. Some of them I don't work for anymore because they just decided to do something different, like close an entire US office or sell to a larger company. So these things will happen to you in your career and you adapt to them. Um, so when I found out we were getting bought, I was pretty freaked out and um, came into the conference room when the guys came over and they're like, we really hope that you stay. Um, we hope everybody stays and we want you all to, uh, to keep functioning as a team. So we were super relieved and it's just a totally different acquisition experience. So that's part of our story and part of our continuing story that we're um, coming into and, and it's another interesting dinner table conversation to have about what that means when you've been this um, independent um, force and then um, you're partnered with, with somebody else. So um, what it allows uh, John to do is retire. He's 72 years old and he's tired. He's been traveling like 100, 200 days a year. Um, 18 million acres. Greater Yellowstone. Anybody been to Yellowstone, Glacier, Lee Metcalf Wilderness, Bob Marshall Wilderness, Gallatin Range, Spanish Peaks, Big Sky? Yeah, it's a pretty good place to ski. Um, and anybody fly fish? Then you guys got to come to Bozeman. It's pretty good. Um, so these things inform what we do, like I was saying. And there's some of the folks that I work with. Um, 20 or so when I made this slide, it, we're up to about 25 right now. Um, and it's a pretty fun, tight-knit crew. We all feel fairly interdependent where um, everybody's firing on all cylinders all the time because, you know, we care about each other's um, livelihood. Doesn't mean that 
I'm going to go have a beer with everybody that I work with, but um, means that I care about every person that I work with and their, their well-being and their family's well-being. Um, so we're, we're all directly revol uh, involved in the outcome and accountable for the outcome of the business. Um, we look at relationship, quality, and social responsibility. Um, we're really big into supply chain management, not just looking at our factory, but who's supplying our factory, who's supplying them. So the people that mold our outsoles and send them to our factory to glue on the bottom of the shoes, where do they get their rubber from? And so that's a big deal to us, and it's a big deal in the industry right now and something that you all need to be thinking about as well. Um, and overall defect and return rate. Anybody know the acceptable defect rate for outdoor footwear? Most obscure question that I'll probably ask. I wouldn't expect you to. It's 2%. So if a brand is getting 2% return or defects, that's totally cool. 98% of the shoes are going to go out there and they're going to work. So it's, it's a bit of a grace um, period. It's... Uh, you know, we like to shoot lower. And from all the sources that we have, from our retailers and from our industry and from our own returns, we're about half a percent. So we're at a quarter of, of that um, acceptable rate. We're also, as far as our larger uh, customers reporting back to us, um, at the lowest um, return rate in, of outdoor footwear industry of all brands and globally. So that's a um, pretty exciting thing. We're focused on quality. Quality comes from any ideas? How do you make something that doesn't break? R&D. R&D, specifically? Word yep. Testing. Testing, breaking, 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 and, um, and relational supply chain management. So if you can develop a relationship with the people that you're working with, at the factory, then when you have an issue, say, like we had an issue, our rubber was, we had, in 2014, we had really slippery rubber and everybody was complaining about it. They're like, we get on a hard, wet surface and these things are like ice skates. Like that's interesting because our rubber formula, we really believe in it and we really believe in our process. We like our supplier. So um, I was, living in Vietnam, working at the factory. So I got on my little 150cc motorbike and rode over to the uh, rubber supplier. And I was like, how's it going? Just wanted to stop in and see what's going on. Start walking around. And I noticed that the machines, the temperatures turned up and the timers turned down on the, on the molds. So if you were making a cake and you were late to a party and you turned up your oven, What's going to happen? You get a crust on the outside and the inside's mush. So that's what was happening to our rubber. So I was like, hey, guys, what's going on? Why are you doing this? And they're like, well, you're pushing us too hard on timeline. So we're trying to keep up with your timeline. And you guys provided um, specifications to us late. So we're trying to catch up. I was like, and it wasn't throwing blame back at us. It was just stating the facts. And it's like, OK, so we need to be better partners. And we need to get our ducks in a row before we can um, help our partners be successful too. So when you're in a relationship with somebody and you have that trust and that level of communication, your problem solving totally turns into a different process. Instead of a blame and shaking fingers or a threatening, I'm gonna go to another supplier, it's like, how do we figure this out between all of us? And um, especially most of the stuff that you're working on, at least now, is gonna be made in Asia. So. That's a totally different culture, totally different way of communicating and problem solving. You guys talk about that factor at all? The Asia factor and cultural factor? Um, cool, yeah. Um, so would you need to learn the language in order to be able to communicate with them? Or, or are the people that you communicate, are they fluent in English? Yeah, most people um, in tech roles are management roles will be fluent in English um, pretty much anywhere you are in Asia. And a lot of folks at, at the footwear factories and apparel factories, they get hired into 
roles of being a brand liaison because of their English skills or their language skills, not because of technical skills, and then they, they backfill with the technical skills. Um, it is helpful to understand. Um, tell you in Chinese or Vietnamese um, or Mandarin or, or Vietnamese, it's really hard. If you're sitting there trying to have a conversation about a mold or like the angle radius of a, a corner on an outsole or something like that, you're, you'd have to be pretty skilled to be able to, to communicate that in, in another language. What's really helpful when you know a little bit of another language is when somebody starts speaking in their own language, two people start speaking in their own language, you know, sorting things out, like problem solving. And you're like, okay, I know the words for longer or shorter or larger, smaller. Um, and you can kind of sense where, hopefully not make assumptions, but sense where the conversation is going. Um, and you can also sometimes, you know, I don't want to characterize anybody as being de deceitful, but if somebody's being, you know, trying to take advantage of a situation, sometimes you can, can get some insight into that. So yeah, absolutely helpful, but not necessary. Yeah. And if you're a language person and your brain works that way, you'll, you'll pick it up by being there too. I, I didn't. My brain doesn't work that way. I, and Vietnamese has seven tones or five tones. So you've heard of Chinese has up, neutral, down. Vietnamese has these sliding tones in between. So it's like I learned all the vocabulary in the world, but they couldn't understand a word I said. <laughs> so what we believe, true to the trail. This is our mantra, and it means a lot of different things. It kind of means something different now than it did uh, 10 years ago. Um, might mean something different to me than it does to our um, sales manager. But really, the, the big part of it is, are we being true to ourselves and true to our values? What are our values is making solutions for people who are doing human powered stuff on trails. And that can mean a lot of different things. And there are a lot of different trails out there too. We're gonna to talk about that in uh, this afternoon for a design challenge for you is finding a new trail for robos. Um, one more tree. Do you know about our tree planting program? That number is wrong. It's two million trees. So we planted two million trees with an organization called Trees for the Future. We've been doing this since the first pair of shoes came off the production line. So um, Trees for the Future is super cool. It's a social, environmental, and economic project. So it's an organization that goes into five countries in sub-Saharan Africa and plants um, trees for farmers. And they take an acre of land, plant trees around the perimeter. The trees themselves pull water up from the water table so there's less surface watering and evaporation and creates a windbreak and creates um, compost for the soil when the leaves blow into the center. And farmers' incomes go up by 300% in the first two to three years. And that's before the, mature, the, 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 tree, the trees mature um, and start bearing fruit and nuts and coffee themselves. So super cool program. And uh, so from now until the end of the year, we're gonna double down and do two trees for every um, pair we sell. So there's some more info on trees for the future. And we believe in tight distribution, relational approach to everything. Yes, sir. Those are, coffee trees? Is that right? Those are fruit, coffee, and nut trees. So not really much to do with the footwear industry. It's just a, a more of a social environmental project. Um, Manage online and Amazon sales map. What all this is talking about is, so if you look at a, a pair of oboes that's not on, you know, not being closed out, and it's 140 bucks, this thing's $140 no matter where you go. You go to Camp Saver store, 140 bucks. You buy it online from Camp Saver, 140 bucks. You buy it from REI.com, anywhere you go. And what that does is create an equal um, and level playing field for all of our retailers and creates a level playing field for um, brick and mortar and for online. So it actually gives a great advantage to, um, to retailers and driving people in to actually get fit 
and um, and find shoes that are, are matched up to their their feet. So um, it's an unusual way of, of doing it. Yeah. Generally, the, the only way that you can legally enforce it is you can't let anyone advertise a lower price. So if it's on the internet, it's advertised. And so it's a contractual agreement. Part of it's legal. Part of it's a general person's agreement between the brand and the, the retailer. Um, it's a pretty unusual way of, of doing things these days, but it's given us the ability, we went from one dealer to 1,100 dealers in the United States in about three years by, by doing it that way. Do it yourself because we can. We do everything in house. We don't buy parts and pieces from other folks. And then it goes into the whole Shoe 101 program, which is for another spring sunny day. Um, all right, so questions on any of that so far? Yeah. I know you mentioned the uh, One Tree Project and you have a lot of other nonprofit stuff. Is that all in house or do you work with like other companies? The One More Tree program is through an organization called Trees for the Future. And they have um, staff in Washington, D.C., and then um, staff on the ground in uh, Senegal. Um, uh, Sudan and three other countries that I can't remember because I'm on the spot. Okay. And then um, we use uh, native generated wind power. Or we buy credits for that. It's like you buy credit into the electrical system. It's not like you know the reservation in Idaho is going to send that their that specific electricity through the line, but things like that. Yeah. So we're we're working with a lot of outside partners, but then we're also working with our new owners, Kathmandu, on a lot of environmental initiatives, um, renewable materials, um, materials made from uh, natural products and from recycled products. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um. Okay, I'm going to talk for a few more minutes, and then we'll just open it up to some general discussion. Um, I was asked to share a little bit about my trajectory. So um, I started out working in a retail store called Northern Lights um, in Bozeman and um, got into boot fitting. And then during the summer, we sold hiking <coughs> shoes, and so sold a lot of that. And then I worked at this other store that was an outdoor store and I kept getting stuck on the footwear floor because nobody wanted to work the footwear floor because you didn't want to work on Saturday afternoon when some drunk lady comes in to buy, you know, a pair of like cheap hiking boots. So, um, but I loved it and it was super human and relational and problem solving. And um, then fast forward, I threw a lot of unforeseen circumstances wound up sleeping on my sister's couch in Boulder um, because I didn't have a place to live or a job. And I answered an ad in the newspaper, if you can remember those things, for this website that sold outdoor gear. They were going to turn the whole world on its, on its ear and started um, working there and working customer service. And then they started writing product copy. And then, since I'd been selling shoes and knew a little bit about it, they wanted me to write all the web descriptions for all the footwear on the site. So that was pretty cool. And meanwhile, Solomon had a design office in the United States in Boulder. It was across the street. And these guys came over. This is like a life-changing moment. These guys come over and said, anybody in here a size 7? We need somebody to try on some shoes before we go to production. And I was like, yeah. So. Um, I went across the street, started trying on shoes every month when, they, when their prototypes came in and fit testing. And about a year later, they asked if I wanted to be the, the guy with the clipboard that asked, how's your toes? How's your arch? How's your heel? Do that for a couple of years and you'll want out of that. But it's a great entry into the... And that's how most people get into product development, not into design. But typically, people get funneled in through a fit testing program and then you get into uh, product development from there, and which is exactly what happened. And um, had an amazing experience 
at Solomon. Um, they were a little loaded up and had just bought um, Arcteryx at the time and, and wanted to um, consolidate some things over in France. I didn't get moved over there. But my boss moved to Pearl Izumi and she, uh, I ran into her at the produce section and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know, looking for a job. And so um, made cycling shoes at, at Pearl Izumi. It was awesome. Um, had an amazing experience. And that was like all learn by doing. No like guidance or here's how to use a sewing machine or this is what a tariff is. It was like, here's a plane ticket to China, see in three weeks. And so that was exciting. And I learned, they say, I don't, a lot of people attribute this quote to Albert Einstein. I don't know who really said it, but um, you're not an expert in your field until you've made every mistake there is to make. So I'm on my way to expert status for sure. <laughs> made a lot of mistakes and cost some companies a lot of money, but then that becomes valuable because you go to the next company and they're like, ah, you're not going to make that same mistake again. So that's part of this whole thing. Is you got you got to accept you're gonna you're gonna blow it at some point. Sorry, this is an adult lesson for you, um, and it's what you do when you blow it that counts. Um, accepting responsibility for the mistake, doing everything necessary to move on from it and um, turning it into a best practice so that it doesn't happen for your organization or yourself again. And then you have that experience and then you can go into a job interview and say, oh yeah, I totally have experience with um, working with the supplier when we have, or what do you do when you're rub you have this component on your shoe and all of a sudden it doesn't work the way that it used to. Like, oh, let me tell you about this rubber experience that I had. So those things you come in and you can, um, you know, increase your, uh, your trajectory. So um, then I was working at Chaco. They shut down the, the Chaco plant in Western Colorado. Everybody went packing. It was super sad. That's another conversation for another time. And there's a whole, probably a semester long course a case study and what happened there. Um, but I wound up doing some contracting. Um, Black Diamond was paying me a lot of money to make straps or design and develop straps for their trekking poles. Um, and But it was only three hours a week. So um, I was making a lot per hour, but I was only getting three hours a week. But So I was actually doing pretty well on those three hours a week and, and doing some other things. And then my phone rang. And a couple folks that I knew that knew those original four guys that I was telling you about um, introduced me to them and um, told me that Oboz was hiring. And I moved to Bozeman, which wasn't a hard decision. Like, that was a decision I didn't even think about. It was like 10-second decision. I'm moving to Bozeman. That's great. It's a, a really wonderful place to be. And hopefully some of you will come out of this program and go to Oboz or Sims or Sitka Gear or Kenetrek. Schnees, did I say Sims? Sims. Um, there's just six off the top of my head. Wookie, Wookie Designs, there's seven. So we got a lot of need in Bozeman for, for folks like you. Questions, thoughts, anything you ever wanted to know about working in the outdoor industry but were afraid to ask? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you know, we get a tax cut on it. It's, um, uh, you know, it, without knowing us, it's hard for me to stand here and say, I was totally altruistic, you know, and I don't believe in altruism anyway. We always, all of us do nice things for each other to gain something. It's a pretty skeptical way to look at life, but it's kind of the way I do. But I, I do think that it was um, from this place of like, you know, footwear, it's a dirty business and there's a lot of impact on the world. The best thing that we can do is create shoes that don't break and keep them on feet, people's feet for a long time, keep them out of landfills as long as we can. That's the number one uh, change and in, in positive impact that we can make. But I think that the tree thing was like, we're, we're having an impact on the environment. This is the most effective way you know, the most effective way isn't to change 
this material to a recycled material, the most effective way is to pull carbon out of the air and to pro provide um, shade and food for, for families. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Um, what's the, uh, like what kind of steps have you guys taken as far as keeping your production process environmentally friendly? Keeping production costs? Production process environmentally friendly, like keeping the impact on the environment now. Admittedly, we have not done a lot with um, materials themselves. But as far as processes go, um, like we're changing our midsole materials to, um, to a lightweight PU. And the primary advantage of it from you know, a performance perspective is that it doesn't take a compression set and it lasts longer. But there's this really cool uh, byproduct, I guess, of it that you don't have to flush the nozzle on the, on the machine every time you change colors. And when you flush nozzles, you use anywhere from 100 to 1,000 gallons of water every time you do a color change. So every time we do a, a manufacturing run and every time that we change color, and you know, there's, we use seven or eight different midsole colors on, on our EVA. So that's you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water uh, a year that's saved. So it's, it's incremental things like that, but it's also um, the factory that you partner with. You can go to Asia and you can um, find a dirt floor factory that's making Little Mermaid flip-flops for a big box discount store, or you can go somewhere that is, um, has craftspeople who are, are making um, beautiful, thoughtful stuff in a beautiful, thoughtful way. So that's the biggest thing, is just partnering with a factory that cares. Um, and then from there, you know, hopefully when I come back and, and talk to you next time, I'll be able to tell you about all our environmental initiatives that we've started as a, you know, now that we have more resources and we have a partner that can help guide us that, that way. Yeah. yeah. You said you did some contract design with Black Diamond um, with their hiking board or whatever. How did you end up getting that gig? Like, how does that, how did they reach out to you? Or how did that yeah, happen? I'd worked at, at Pearl Izumi. Um, it was kind of a perception thing because at Pearl I did um, cycling shoes, but at the time they had come out with some running shoes that had welded TPU, and they were one of the first people to do an HF uh, welded TPU on top of uh, structural mesh. And um, I knew about that process, and I'd done some of that on cycling too, but it was more in that running realm. But at the time, not a lot of people had experience with it. And they wanted you to do a fully welded HF um, without any stitching on it. And so they reached out to me because they, know, they knew that I had had that, that specific experience. And it was, you know, I don't know. I, I love to throw that black diamond thing out there, but it was a, it was a little sliver of a project. And there, that's another dinner table conversation, too, of why and how. Uh, that's another another day. Yes. It was all who you know. Like that original Solomon job was I knew those guys. I met the guys randomly, but developed a relationship with them over a year when they finally offered me a job. My going to Pearl was that woman, Ann Wiper, that I was working for, like, well, actually three or four levels above me at Solomon. Um, when she moved to Pearl, just recognized that, you know, I was maybe not technically proficient, but I was pretty eager. And so I think all, I, got, I got recruited at Chaco by like a, one of those headhunter recruiting firms. Um, but I think that's the only time I've ever been actually recruited. Everything, every other job that I've ever had has come from a relationship with somebody. Be careful because the people that you're working with in your first job, they might be your boss someday or might be making decisions about your career. I told the story this morning of um, Greg Ginsky. Uh, he's the director of design at Arcteryx, arguably one of the highest level, most coveted jobs in our industry, right? 
pretty um, top tier brand, pretty big position. He was an intern at Solomon when I was working there. I was just a kid in school. Now I see him at OR and I'm like, you're the man. It's pretty cool. So I don't know how I got onto that, but oh yeah, everybody you meet. And it's tough because you don't want to make relationships so that you can further your career. That's, that'll kill you in this industry because people will see through it. But if you just develop genuine trusting relationships with people, people are so willing to help you out. What is a last? What is a last? A last is what we build the shoe around. So a last determines 80% of the internal structure of the shoe, the, or the fit of the shoe. And the other 20% are made up by, any guesses? So if this is 80%, where's the other 20% come from? Think about it. Materials, construction, pattern, okay. And there's, there's a lass, your sandal lass back there. That thing's awesome. Um, had some fun talking about that thing. So that's a, a great example of how lass works. So you're coming up with this thing that represents fit. So if you want the internal dimensions of your shoe to be narrow and sit, fit someone with a narrow foot, then you have a narrow last. If you want a wide fitting shoe, like an ultra, then you make a wide last and build the shoe around it. Then we tape up the last, draw the pattern directly onto the last. It's harder to see on this one, but if you hold your sandal last up, you can see the sandal pattern drawn directly on it. And that way all the curves and the proportions of his sandal are gonna work when you start building a pattern. Rather than just looking at it in 2D, you can look how everything integrates in 3D. You split that tape down the back and pull the tape off, and that's the beginning of your pattern. And you can digitize it, you can do all, all kinds of things. Our, our pattern maker does everything by hand from scratch with, um, with a mast last. And then you take an upper, and you wrap the shoe around the last. So then you go from that pattern to a stitched upper, pull it over the last, and close it. There are a couple different ways to last, but that's the, the basic. If you want to know more about how things are lasted and different lasting methods, I'll give you all the password for our education um, site where you can see all this stuff being made in the factory. So that's what it ends up like. So do you have an, an individual one, an individual last for every shoe? That you um, groups of shoes share lasts. Um, usually a bottom, like an outsole midsole package, is shared with a shoe. And um, the bottom of that last has the exact same shot, shape as the top of the midsole. And they kind of Lego together. Um, and so we use four or five different lasts and so four or five different families of shoes. We have like a lower volume. Um, we've got a women specific and we've got a higher volume. And then we have wide versions of the same lasts where it just grows around the, the metatarsals or the ball of the foot. Any other? Can you speak to the, the fit issue? Because in many apparel segments, we can have a classic, relaxed, slim fit. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about how correspondingly you try to handle that in terms of sock volume, uh, time of year use, et cetera? Okay, yeah, for sure. So um, as far as within our own line, um, let me grab that last here real quick. So I didn't even mention our, our secret sauce is this insole. And this thing comes in every pair of shoes that we make. That's like people ask what's different about Oboes than any other outdoor footwear brand. And that's really the, the big thing. This thing's worth like 40, 50 bucks. Um, and so in that you have to build 
whatever the dimension of that is, you have to build onto the bottom of the last. So once you get the last um, determined and your fit determined, then you got to decide what kind of insole that you're going to use. So if you have an insulated product, then which we use a winter felted wool um, insole, then we have to build on to the bottom of the last to accommodate for that extra volume. If you have an insulated product with 400 grams of insulate, then you want, might want to adjust that last and scale it up because you don't build out from the last. You pull everything and wrap it around the last tight, and then you pull the last out while it's under tension. And all that stuff springs back into the shoe. So you have to create some more room on that. Are, are you referencing kind of what we were talking about this morning with the different fits or? A little bit, but I was also thinking about how there's this gap. And, and so we, last we've had for millennium shoemakers. And yet I was thinking that the idea of gap isn't inferred. And I just, I've never seen a drawing that showed an inferred gap between last, and is that because the last itself increases in volume for the same foot size, but for thicker socks? Or so, for instance, a, a double boot for mountaineering in, in the Himalaya. It, it's got to be accounting for that somehow. Yeah, there's a last for the liner and a last for the shell. Oh. So, like if uh, you were looking at ski boots, there would be a last at that. Um, that that thermoformable liner was built around. That's a pretty generic last because you're gonna heat mold it and fit it to somebody's foot anyway. And then there's usually an aluminum last that the, the shell is injected around. Um, you know, with, the, with a thicker, thinner sock, um, for us, we, or I say for us being in the outdoor world, we don't get as nitty gritty technical on, on that. It's more, you know, if it fits your foot, it fits your foot. If it's too, sight, too tight with a thick sock, you need, you need to either go to a wide version of our shoe or a, a different brand that has something wider. So we're not getting that specific with, um, with sock volume as much as we're really looking at trying to match up the shape, the internal shape of the shoe with the external shape of the, the foot. So what's unique cool. about your guys' insoles? Um, they're, okay, I'm gonna do this in quick. <laughs> um, all right, here's your foot. Uh, so this is not real. Um, <laughs> Ultra, you all know Ultra, zero drop. Four foot running, big thing, right? So that's awesome because you're using your body's natural cushioning mechanism. You're even using some natural pronation that, that's good when you're running. When you start hiking, you heel strike, transition, push off. So you have impact, you have load from a backpack, you have fatigue on your body because most of us aren't going out and backpacking all day every day. So you're introducing those three um, forces on the body. And so what happens is um, this arch can start collapsing. I do a demonstration for our retailers. It's going to be hard for you guys in the back to see. Um, are you folks in the back to see? So elongation, deformation, you hear that grinding? It starts grinding your cartilage away. Then put that on a structural insole. Very little movement, which in a running situation is not optimal, but in a hiking situation can be really optimal to try to support that arch. Not like a motion control, but just a little bit of extra support. And so in that hiking or outdoor footwear world, it's really common to sell a pair of shoes with an aftermarket insole. So that's part of the fitting process and part of the buying process. You buy a boot, you buy an insole to go in the boot to take care of that or to match to our arch height. And what we've done is put this structural um, piece in the shoe that already does that. And that's something that no one else 
has been doing for lots and lots of reasons, mostly a costing thing. We started the company built around this and the cost of this. Is that, so that help? why your customer base is older? Because they're biomechanical problems? <laughs> <laughs> probably so. And probably because we're a bunch of 40 and 50 year old dudes sitting around a conference table. That I think you had a, I, yeah, okay. Um, Oh, wow. Um, you get people who've been over there already. <laughs> um, you don't want to just get on a plane and go over there and find somebody. You definitely don't want to do it through email or over the phone. Um, it's kind of networking is so, you know, somebody associated with, with the program. Like if you had a product and you started your company and you were going to make whatever, and you needed a factory for it, you just start networking and get some good recommendations on it. And then you'd have to find a factory. The biggest challenge is finding a factory that's going to take a risk on a small company and be willing to grow with you and, and, and do some lower minimums. So just all these people that you're in class with, they're all going to go places, and you're going to help them, and they're going to help you. And then all of us who come in and teach the seminars, if you needed a shoe factory, you could certainly call me and I could give you some recommendations. Yeah? So um, with the way that the interval is like, structured, would you say that it eliminates the need for orth orthopedics in the booth? My philosophy on this is that I don't argue with medical professionals. So if a podorthis or... Um, or uh, um, or a doctor prescribes an insole for somebody, then I say take ours out and put theirs in, theirs in. The huge advantage with us is that when you take that insole out, it's thicker than almost anything else on the wall, so it's going to leave you more room inside the shoe to work with some of those more structural orthotics. Um, we do have tons of anecdotal uh, accounts of people saying that they had orthotics, they wore our shoes, and they don't need orthotics anymore. I, you know, that's a, a pretty big claim that um, we we don't have the data to back up. Time-wise, we. Uh... Uh, if we're going to do any uh, fitting or any more hands-on, probably maybe one or two questions. Let's, okay, uh, I uh, totally forgot to bring the demo shoes in. Okay, if, you, if we're going to do hands-on, why don't we do a couple more questions? So David asked, how could we? Uh, best let you all check out his stuff, and I told him let's end a little early so that you can come up and get hands on the demos rather than try to pass them all through. Some of you are probably super footwear geeks and really want to have a chance to do that. Others may get head off. So are there a couple more questions that we can take and then a break to that? Or anybody who's not going to be able to stick around and has to run off to another event or class have a question? Okay, so uh, questions? Uh, okay, haven't heard from you. Are your shoes designed to be primarily hiking shoes, or could you use them as more of like an everyday shoe? They are definitely a hiking shoe, but we sell a ton, and we just discovered the shoe store channel two or three years ago, and it has uh, totally changed our business, like our income. It's been uh, amazing how many people will go to a shoe store and buy something like this to to walk the dog or, or just to do chores or whatever. So there's a lot of crossover, but they're primarily made for hiking. There was, yeah. I guess a similar question. Is there any use of utility in these, or are they purely hiking boots? Are they utility boots at all? Oh, you mean like a work boot? Or No, because it's they don't have a non-slip rating. I mean, the rubber's grippy. for They're optimized for, for trail. And... So to optimize them for trail, it's really hard to optimize them for a shop floor. And that's a pretty specific rubber compound to have an anti-slip on oil. So we have done a lot, we've had a lot of discussion over making safety toe non-slip versions. So I have one kind of culminating question uh, that you and I talked at the beginning and then you also mentioned to them that they'll be five, six, seven years ahead of where you felt you started. If you were to go back and do your career again versus project their careers out 20 years, do you kind of have an overarching thing that you would advise to them that you wish you had known at the earlier part of your career? 
Yeah, can I swear in Utah? Yes. Work your ass off. <laughs> like, you know, don't... Uh, the, the big beef that people my age have with people your age, and I really dislike that whole millennial bashing thing, and is that... And I'm sure that a lot of people felt this way about me when I was 25, is people feel like your generation doesn't want to work for it. That they get out of school and they just expect you're going to make 70 grand a year and be, you know, in charge of a lot of important stuff. And, you know, you might get out and make 40 grand a year and be, you know, spend half your time in the materials library organizing it. I hope that's not the case and probably won't be the case, but you got to pay your dues and you got to work super, super hard and you got to be willing to travel and you got to be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and be willing to deal with conflict with your coworkers, be willing to take the risk to talk back to those who are in charge and who are calling the shots and tell them when you think that you have a, a valid idea for women, you gotta not let anybody talk over you. I did it today. I talked over Jen today. So um, don't let people like me do that. It's my responsibility to not do it. But um, so you gotta stand up for yourself. And nutshell, stand up for yourself. Work harder than you think you can work, and you'll succeed, guaranteed.